Hey everybody, uh, my name is Valentin. Um, I like to start off my talk with just what's on my wallpaper, my desktop. Uh, I'm going to play a little game. Who can guess what this lovely creature is? It's an animal. It's a hippo. Okay, we got a hippo. It's a confused it's giraffe. Confused it's giraffe. It's an ostrich, right? Ostrich. ostrich. Okay, I heard ostrich. That is correct. Uh, <laughs> I went to I went to Kenya in January of last year for four months, and I met this lovely creature and. Most people don't really look at an ostrich from this perspective. Usually it's the whole body, right? You don't, you don't really, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. Anyway, I just figured we'd start there. And there's a folder here that says, don't go in here. We won't be going in there. Um, <laughs> Sold that ostrich porn. <laughs> okay. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a tech art project that I worked on. Um, the idea is uh, we wanted to make something where you can control music through dance. Um, so actually, let me, let me take a step back. Uh, a few years ago, I took an amazing course uh, at the University of Waterloo. It was literally called Tech Art, where they take a fine art student and an engineer, and they put you together, and then you make art. And then the crazy part is they managed to have it uh, count as a technical elective. Um, so like, that was like, one of the best experiences in my life. I was like, wow, like, I can do tech related stuff but then make something I love and have like a social impact or just have fun you know it was just like I could really express myself. Um, two years later this hackathon showed up in my newsfeed uh, called Change Up where they were doing literally the exact same thing take a bunch of artists take a bunch of technologists <laughs> put them in a room together um, and make get them to make stuff. So um, I pitched this idea on the first day uh, I wanted to liberate the creation of music from professionals and instead empower people to have a direct impact on the music they are listening to through their bodies. As people's bodies influence the music through dance and in turn the music influences the dancers, a beautiful feedback loop occurs where both are influencing each other. You know, you got to have an artistic statement when you're talking to artists. Um, <laughs> but I really... Yeah, it's almost a manifesto. Yeah, it is, it's a manifesto. So the idea here is... Um, you know, I wanted to experiment with music and people dancing, um, and maybe there's an artistic statement there, but today we're going to be talking about the tech behind such a thing. Um, and I needed to assemble a team to do this, uh, so I found people there at the hackathon to do this. Um, Paul, Evan, and Gina, uh, they're all musically inclined. I was like the only tech person there. Um, and uh, we're like, we're sitting there, and we're like, okay, so how do we do this? We have a weekend to generate music and then make a room where you can dance and it will affect the music, that sounds really difficult. Um, but I kind of put my computer vision hat on. I was like, okay, what is the simplest thing I can do in computer vision? Turns out it's this thing called thresholding where um, you can take a, you can look for a particular color. And in this case, I was thinking, okay, what is the color least likely that people are gonna wear? Bright neon pink. Uh, so we made these like wristbands and we said, okay, we'll look for that bright pink color and that'll be the basis of where we start. So, oh, okay. So I'm going to actually fast forward to what we created and then I'll kind of take a step back and, and show you all what, what actually happened. Um, this is Gina. She comes in and she starts dancing and the, and the system picks up where she's uh, dancing. Um, it's really quite slow just because I was recording the, the video, but trust me, this is in real time. It works well. Um, and as more people come into the, into the room, the music gets more intense. Um, in the background, what's actually happening is a random like uh, drum beat is being tried out all the time. So when people are kind of gone out of the scene, random drum beats are being tried, and then once people come in, the drum beat is locked in. Now, the music is a total prototype in this case. Um, we were really just experimenting with, can we dance and influence the music in such a way? Um, yeah, so that's kind of like what we made on that weekend. Um, so you're probably wondering, well, how does this actually work? Um, you have a video camera. Um, you use OpenCV to extract particular computer vision features out of them, which I'll get to. Um, and then you need to actually feed that into some sort of music system. So it turns out all the DJs and producers, that, most of them at least, I don't want to speak for them, but you know, I hear they use Ableton. Um, and the question is, well, how do you actually communicate with something? Like, how do you communicate in the music domain? It turns out MIDI, the thing from like what the 70s or 60s, I don't even know, it's really old technology, that's how you communicate with them. And, sorry? Oh, I heard somebody said it's not a technology. Um, 
Can it's you? A notation. It's a notation. Yeah. Mm. Well, from my understanding, uh, correct Digital me if I'm wrong here. Uh, mm. Okay. Cool. So it's a digit. Mm, mm. So, someone in the audience. I don't know. Your, what's what's your name? Sorry. Eugene. Sorry. I'm Eugene. Ah, Eugene has told me that MIDI is a digital notation language. Um, so the idea is, you know, you send your notes over through some sort of channel um, to Ableton. Um, in this case, uh, we decided we were going to encode our features extracted out of the computer vision as um, MIDI control change notes. Um, so it gets fed into Ableton, and at this point, I'm not going to talk about what happens in Ableton because I really don't know, but like the, the music mixing people, they, they figured it out. But they somehow mapped the data coming out of the computer vision into the music um, that comes out of the speaker. So um, the way this was built was using Python and uh, OpenCV. Um, has anyone here worked with OpenCV before? Like a few people? OK, cool. Uh, that's awesome. Great. I can teach you a little bit about it. So. Uh, OpenCV is all about um, real-time computer vision. And the question is, is like, what it actually is computer vision? The, uh, this isn't a textbook definition. I might get it wrong. Maybe Eugene will correct me. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the idea is a computer is looking at an image or a video and trying to determine something about it. Usually, this is used in like factories um, to maybe detect like where is the widget on the assembly line, you know, to aim maybe a robot to like grab the widget. I'm just co completely contrived example. I don't actually know what happens in, in, a, in, a, in a factory. But uh, the idea is that the computer is looking at an image and trying to determine um, something about what it's looking at. Um, and then another thing that is used is scikit-image, where it's a collection of algorithms for image processing. Um, so this might be things like um, distorting an image, changing its colors, um, maybe trying to extract, uh, oh, I'm looking for squares. Um, maybe it'll help me find squares. It has a whole lot, lot of um, different algorithms for this stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about what actually went into this like, dance system and hopefully like, teach you um, some of the concepts behind computer vision. So in this case, we have three major features. Um, oh, let me take a, step, take a step back. What we're doing is we're looking for kind of areas of pink. Um, so we call these blobs in this case. Um, so we're looking for areas of pink. And um, what we want to do is we kind of count how many of them there are. And this is like a proxy towards how many people are on the dance floor, right? Because each person has two. Maybe divided by two, you have a rough idea of how many people are on the dance floor. So, uh, I'll get to how we actually detect where the blobs are. Uh, but at a high level, we, we count how many they are. And then we figure out what are the distances between all of them using some trigonometry. And then we can get the average distance between all of them. And that gives us an idea of how close people are, right? Are they all spread out? Are they all together dancing? You know, is it a bunch of strangers or a bunch of friends? That kind of a thing. And then the last one is, how much movement is there amongst all the people dancing? Are they standing still? Or are they moving a lot, right? Um, so those are the kind of the three things that we came up with uh, that we thought would be useful for you for um, influencing the music. So I'm going to get into each of them and tell you how it's derived step by step. So the first is like uh, what we need to do is kind of have an idea of where are the, the pink areas. Um, so what we did here is we use a technique called thresholding, where what you do is you look for a range of colors. Um, in this case, there's actually some code I extracted here. You know, you run a CV2 function um, on on your image, and you say, "I'm looking for, I'm looking for kind of colors between this color and that color." Um, the numbers aren't really important here, but it's basically defining uh, shades of pink uh, in this case, and it basically returns white for everywhere where that pink was found, and and black for everything else. I've colored it here just to make it a little easier to see. So now we have what's called a mask, which is kind of like everywhere where there's like a 1 or white is the thing you're looking for. And everywhere that's black or 0 is the thing that um, you're not looking for. OK. So based off of this, we then run something called um, blob detection. There's many different ways of doing blob detection. I'm going to talk about just one. It's called um, a difference of Gaussians. I'm just going to name it. I'm not going to get into the math. Um, you know. I don't really know it that well. Uh, and if I were to try to teach you, it would probably take like 30 minutes. And to be honest, at this point, it's not really worth it. 
The only kind of important thing to know is that there is a library out there where you can do blob detection and get the centers of your blobs. So the green points that you see there are um, the actual centers of those, um, of those, of those uh, regions that we found from thresholding. Does that make sense so far, everyone? Any questions? Cool, awesome. So now we can, now we count. We've counted all of our blobs. We found where they are, and now we can move on to the next step, which is uh, measuring their distances. So if these are on a two-dimensional um, grid, uh, you can do some trigonometry, do some Pythagorean, uh, Pythagor how does it? Someone's got to tell me, how do you, how do you pronounce this? Pa pa Pythagorean. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Uh, Pythagorean. Anyway, I, cannot, I haven't been able to say it since I learned it. I, the, the triangles, you know. So, um, you know, you do some math and you can discover how long they are, do some trigonometry. Um, now, the interesting th here, thing here is that you actually use a little bit of graph theory to, to do this. You need a fully connected graph. Um, but you also want to make sure that none of the points are connected more than once to each other. So, um, I'll leave that as an exercise to the listener to come up with what graph theory. Does anyone have any idea what graph, thing, uh, graph theory algorithm might be used for this? Anyway, it was not part of the talk, but the point is there's some graph theory. Who would have known in like a dance thing that you use that, right? Um, What's the algorithm? Well, it's, uh, hmm, I kind of rolled my own. I, I guess you could consider it a depth first search where you start at one node and you try to connect it to all the others. And then you discard you like discard that node, and you move on to the next one and connect it to all the others. Um, I guess you could think of it as like having a queue and then connecting to all of them. There's probably a fancy word. The reason I asked the crowd, I was like, "Can somebody tell me what this algorithm is?" Because <laughs> I don't. Okay, please. I really need to know. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm kind of going to skip ahead and going to say the code is all available on GitHub. So if you want to figure out how it works, you can do that. Um, okay, so we've got all the distances between all the points, um, and that gives us our kind of average distance. How closely are people together? Are they strangers? Are they friends? Maybe they're new friends because they've been dancing and they love each other's moves. Um, so hopefully that distance goes lower. Um, okay, the next point that we get to is the, um, the centroid of this um, area. So do some more math, get the average. Uh, location by taking basically all the x and y coordinates, sum them all up, divide them by the number, and you get your average point. Um, so then what you can do is if you take the points over time and then average those and then see how far they are from that like average of the average points, you can kind of get an idea of how much people are moving. Again, like I, this was like probably 9 o'clock on like the last day. And I was, you know, just coming up with random stuff and coding it really quickly. Maybe there's a better way of doing this. Um, please come up to me later if you have ideas. Um, but anyway, that's that's what I came up with. And um, you put all this together. Um, oh, right, I forgot to mention. You can. This was actually to the point I was making. I actually made a visualization of this. Uh, if you, if the white is the average of all the average points, you can get its distance um, and then have an idea of how much movement there is. So, so that's it. You know, you can do all this stuff and then put it on a screen, and then people can dance, and um, cool things happen. So, I'm going to talk about a few of the challenges that happened. Um, we got there. Oh, I forgot to mention. After the hackathon, they really liked it, and they said, "You know what? We want to make this into an installation." We're like, "Whoa, this is serious now." I thought this was just a joke. You know, that whole remember that whole manifesto here? Like, <laughs> that was that was a joke. Like. I can't believe A, that people joined up for this ridiculous <laughs> idea, and, and you know, B, you know, the art critics were like, oh, we like this. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh, got to make it real. So they invited us about a month later to install it with all the other um, hackathon people who managed to produce something. We installed it for one night at the Toronto Media Arts Center. It's actually quite close to here. Um, so we had it for one night. and. Um, yeah, so we got there, we install a, a fisheye lens on the roof, and then, does anyone see any problems with this image? The lighting. The lighting, exactly. There are no, like, it cannot detect a single, like, <laughs> wristband. Actually, it says one, but 
you know, uh oh, what do we do? So it turns out we had to re recalibrate. That was actually me right there. Um, you can see me on the computer there. Uh, can't see my facial expression, but it was something probably like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we had to, cal the first problem was lighting, right? Um, so we basically painstakingly sat there for like 15, 30 minutes just messing with those. Remember those values where it was like, oh, you don't need to worry about them. Like, then I had to like basically trial and error changing a bunch of them to make it work. Because I thought I could do the math. I thought I could like really like reason about this and think, you know, and I tried, and then it was like, no, like I, I don't understand this. Um, so a lot of trial and error. You know, I'm probably not doing justice for like the people who are like, I want to learn something about computer vision. Because <laughs> okay. So um, at this point, uh, we got it all working. It was great. Uh, actually, you can see here uh, in that little window, that's, that's kind of like what the computer is seeing on the thresholding step uh, for all the pink areas. Um, another challenge was people hacked it. They started using it in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, this one person, he decided to break dance and like just, it's crazy stuff right there, you know? Totally not intended. Um, other, another person, what they did was, uh, so he's a really smart person. He, he comes up with the phone and says, you know what? I bet you I can fool your algorithm into thinking I'm wearing a wristband when I'm not. And I'm like, OK, show me. Whips out his phone, f has this app where you can pick a very particular color to shine, puts the brightness all the way up, goes up to the camera, is like, ha, I have a wristband on. And he starts dancing, and I'm like, OK, hmm, so what exactly have you accomplished here? I see I've gotten you in this room, and you're dancing and having a good time. So what are you circumventing here? I don't know. But that was kind of fun. It was like unexpected, right? People just start messing with your stuff. Um, disclaimer, a lot of people had a whole lot of fun with this thing. But all of my videos, it looks like no one is enjoying themselves. Because <laughs> you can kind of see there was like, why is there no one there? Um, turns out I was so excited to show this thing off that I didn't actually take any videos until like the very end when like this person showed up. Um, another thing was, um, again, these people look like they're not enjoying themselves and they're, you know, they're just like, what do I do? <laughs> it's really quite embarrassing, but um, they really did have a lot of fun. Um, it was really, because people would get excited like, oh my gosh, I can, I can influence the music. You know, I can, like, I'm, it's no longer a passive activity, right? Um, so that was the really fun part of the exploration. And what I wanted to get at with this whole thing was that um, you, know, you can make art too. Just because you make technology or you're interested in technology um, doesn't mean that you, know, there's this, like, that you can't contribute to art. Um, you know, it's simply, it's just showing up. Is like, I think like Woody Allen might have said, somebody told me this quote today, like, like most of life is just showing up. Right? And I, I think Woody Allen might be a controversial character at this point. Some, some, I don't know if I should be quoting him at this point. But the point is, is that you know, um, it's a great quote. It's like just showing up is like half, the, half, the, you know, half of life, right? So um, you know, just showing up to a hackathon or showing up to a meetup or um, you know, just connecting with people in a completely different domain um, can get you exposed and give you the opportunity to be put in the deep end to be like, oh crap, like now I gotta fulfill this thing. I made a crazy manifesto and now I gotta like, you know, <laughs> do something. Um, so yeah, I mean try it out, you know. Um, I know like a lot of the industry is about like we gotta make some money, we gotta make a product, you know, we have like business goals to achieve, right? But like when's the last time you had fun with like actually like doing something? Um, I hope the answer is all the time, right? But um, you know, there are hackathons and meetups and stuff like that where you can go and just like mess around with technology um, and make people smile because most of the people, most of the artists, most of the people that came to see it, they were like, oh my gosh, my mind is blown. Like, this is so cool. I had no idea technology can do that. Whereas maybe some people who are technologists are like, oh, that's super easy. This is like 1980s technology. Like, you know, <laughs> like what's so impressive about this, right? Um, so I guess that's the kind of like the point of this talk is not so much like the the technical contributions, but more about like applying your technology into domains that are severely underserved by that technology. So there's source code. Um, you can check it out. Um, and uh, shameless plug, I work at an uh, autonomous car company called Passenger AI. We do computer vision stuff. Um, so we don't do the self-driving part. We actually do 
uh, a part that most people don't think about is when there's no driver, who is like policing the people inside the car to make sure they're not drinking, smoking, vomiting all over the place, you know, um, just destroying vehicles. Uh, so we, uh, we work on a camera system that um, attempts to detect these things automatically, like if someone has a gun or they start assaulting another person um, or they start saying help. Um, so what we work on is a computer vision technology that can, um, that can detect this kind of stuff. And the idea is that we only want to be, for privacy reasons, we only want to be recording things in the cabin when there's an actual emergency. So the computer is the one doing all the detecting, and then once there is an actual issue, then it's surfaced to a person, and we only kind of stream the video to, um, to, to a server when there's something to be streamed. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in working on technology like that, come talk to me. Uh, if not, come talk to me about art or computer vision, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, shameless plug, Passenger AI is where I work. You can email me at valentina at passenger.ai. If you're looking for a job, we're hiring for software engineers and uh, computer vision people. Um, but uh, my other face is you can just come contact me just about other stuff um, and come talk to me after this talk. Um, and I think. That is it, and I will leave you with our friend, Ostrich. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and does anyone have any questions? I don't know. Um, yeah, I got two questions. So one uh, was about that uh, movement thing. So uh, are you using the sum of the distances, or are you using the change in the sum of the distances? Um, so I guess it's, the answer is yes, both. Um, so what's happening here is each of those red dots, and let me know if I'm answering your question or not properly, but each of those is, um, let's take a step back. Um, all of these are where the people are in an instantaneous point in time. And then we take the average point of that, which is the red dot. And then over a few seconds, we might capture like 50 of these. Here I've just simplified the example, but we have a whole, the red dots are like over time where, where these um, centers of people have been. And then we take the average of that and then get all the distances. Oh, so you're, you're calculating uh, the movement as the change in the average uh, point. Yeah. OK, yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, okay. I understand now. Um, my second thing was, uh, did you look at uh, adaptive uh, thresholding at all for, because uh, you mentioned the problem of having different sort of uh, lighting mm -hmm. in the thing. Did you look at adaptive? Um, not really, because once we got the colors and it worked for the rest of the night. Because the lighting doesn't. Good enough. <laughs> yeah, it's good enough, right? Um, maybe in a more production version of maybe like uh, if, you, if you're making this for venues where the lightings can change and stuff, then definitely. Um, other things that you can try to do is maybe have particular patterns that you're looking for like on the wristbands, not just like solid colors. Um, to answer your question, no, wasn't required. Uh, I'd like to learn about adaptive thresholding. I understand the concept, but um, it's just something I've never had to really like dig into. Yeah, it's, uh, so I've, I've used OpenCV a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I also know nothing about, <laughs> like how it works. But mm. uh, yeah, I ran into similar problems with different lighting when I was using it, so I'm just wondering. Cool. Let's talk after this. Yeah, sure. Mm. Uh, any other questions? What was the time difference between That's a really great question. I should pull up the code, and we can see. Um, sound cave. Where's the code? Um, my guess is that it's probably maybe like 250 milliseconds, something like that. I'm going to try opening this, hopefully. Oh, it opens an Xcode. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm trying to avoid. Uh, um, so I'm going to get you that answer. Um, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, that was hmm. my next one was like, um, what was the hardware that you ran this computer on? This computer, <laughs> believe it or not. So, we, so actually, let's take a step back. There was a computer like doing the computer vision extraction stuff, and then we had another computer doing the audio mixing stuff. Um, we just found that like we couldn't do the image processing and the music generation on one computer because it just wasn't enough uh, powerful hardware. Right. 
Um, so what we did is we actually got this special USB cable with a little box in between where you could um, send MIDI um, data and it would relay it to the other computer. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a sleep in here. We're going to find out in a few moments. Hmm. I have no idea what rate it runs at. <laughs> fast as it can. It fast as it can, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's just a while true. And um, yeah. Probably the camera's like frame rate. Yeah. 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 Um, it, was, it's been, it says here it's been three months ago that I touched this code, so I can't quite remember. <laughs> but that's a really great question. Um, well, the, you have one basic assumption is that uh, nobody, nobody would show up on the dance floor wearing this shocking pink. I guess I've never met my wife. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, now a bit seriously, uh, mm. if I would be tasked with this, uh, with this thing, my first inclination would be to see, okay, can we measure vibration on a dance floor with sensors and mm. try to Instead of, you know, putting wristbands and then having all kind of hackers uh, snapping their uh, <coughs> their phones, yeah, yeah. You know, their yeah. phones or who who knows what. Uh, mm. I would try to go down this direction. Yeah, that's a really great. That, that's a really great question. Uh, I've actually worked on pressure systems, and I've built my own like pressure map before. Um, the problem, there's, there's two problems with that, and I don't want to shoot it down. I'm, like it might actually be very possible and a more foolproof kind of like way. Um, one of the ways that you could you'd be able to do it is through a force sensitive resistor, which is like a resistor that changes based off how much force there is. Um, the problem is they're really expensive. They're like five dollars each, and then they're really small. And if you wanted to cover, you know, the whole dance floor, you're looking, and then you have to wire it, and then you have to make sure no one spills their drink, and so you have to make it waterproof. You know, um, if you have other ideas of how this would work, maybe like. Uh, you have like, what do they use in like art galleries or whatever, like the vibration, you know? I don't actually know if art galleries use it, but there's probably like seismographs, right, that could probably tell. So you put a little, few local ones and maybe you could tell. Yeah, that could work too, yeah. And you make it like an intimate setting where you're like, yeah, you take your shoes off because it's somebody's home and stuff. Um, um, there's probably all sorts of different ways of detecting how people are dancing. Um, do you have any other ideas? Well, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, you could maybe do sound. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. Cool.